there. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming out on this uh, damp day. Like Andy said, what we're really uh, going to be getting to here as the main event is a conversation. And uh, my hope is that in the course of the conversation that we can discover something new, find some new understanding. And that, to do that, it's going to depend um, a little bit on me, but a lot on you. So if, you, if we can just get that mindset uh, here from the beginning, that what we're trying to do is come to some kind of new understanding. If not new under the sun, new for you and me. And uh, to kind of set the stage and, and get the conversation going about art and democracy, which really is a subject we probably know a lot about, but maybe don't have that many occasions to talk about. And likewise with uh, a people's theater. I remember when uh, Robert Putnam was working on Bowling Alone, I was talking to him. And he said, what happened to all the community theaters that used to do local plays? What happened to all the playwrights in, for example, New York State, that uh, my, whether they were farmers or, or working in a, in a factory that were right, what happened to all of that local playwriting and that local production? And it was a good question. And um, so, and it put a kind of odd spin on the idea of um, bowling alone, this idea of playing alone. And uh, so I think we know more about the subject than, than maybe we have occasion to talk to. At any rate, to get our conversation going, I'm going to begin uh, by telling three stories. And I hope from the stories that we can then draw out uh, the conversation. So uh, <clears throat> the first story uh, is set in the year 2000, the presidential election, Bush v. Gore, we all remember that, is heating up. And a local editor of a local Florida paper sends his young cub reporter out to take the pulse of the voter. This young reporter goes to a retirement condo sees a couple of fellows having their morning coffee, cigar, reading the newspaper. She says, well, these seem like a, a likely two guys. She says, uh, introduces herself, explains what her assignment is, and says, fellas, what, what, what I got to report on is what do you think is at stake in this upcoming presidential election? Well, without without thinking, really, without certainly uh, skipping a beat, the first guy says, well, the economy. And then the second guy right on the heel says, Supreme Court. And then almost together, these two fellows put down their cigar and say, the culture. And the reporter sort of rocks back and says, geez, fellas, I understand the economy. I understand, you know, who gets appointed to the Supreme Court. But what do you mean when you say the culture is at stake in this election. And the first guy says, well, who controls the culture? And his buddy finishes the sentence, controls the story the nation tells itself. Second story I want to tell is uh, a story from our theater's experience. We make a, as Eric said, we make a lot of a new plays. In fact, all the plays we make are new. We've made 60-some, and they're at very different scales. Some of them are just small community productions, uh, maybe going to run for a couple of weeks. Others stay in the repertoire and tour nationally, some internationally. So uh, one group of plays we've made, maybe about a third of these 60 plays, are what we call intercultural plays, okay? So intercultural plays between two cultures. And the play I'm going to talk about is one called Junebug Jack. Now, we made this play with an African-American company 
from New Orleans, Junebug Productions. Now, Junebug Productions is the direct descendant of the Free Southern Theater, and the Free Southern Theater was the theater wing of SNCC during the civil, uh, Southern Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. So that's the kind of pedigree of Junebug Productions. So here we've got this African-American company <clears throat> down in New Orleans, this Appalachian company in Whitesburg, Kentucky, white company, black company. So we'd been making a lot of plays together, so we, we'd built up a lot of trust and friendship. Anyway, we decided to tackle this play about the intersection of race and class. Now, um, you know, thank goodness it was theater because the subject uh, can lend itself to grimness. But uh, it, it was going to be a theater piece, and with our theater, there's always a lot of music, a lot of original music, a lot of song from the stage. So here we go to make this play about race and class. Now, there's an image we have when we make these intercultural plays. And the image we have, which we use as a metaphor, is that of a bridge with a span, okay? So the play we're going to make is this span, and it's going to be something new. But the strength of that span depends in part on the strength of the posting on either side. And that posting on either side is the cultural root of the two companies. So what we want to happen, and we have this image as we're developing the work, what we want to happen is when the audience sees the play, we want them to feel both their own tradition tremendously reinforced that posting, as well as to see something new. So here we go. That's the image we have for creating this play about race and class. Now, when you tackle a topic like that, regardless of how much friendship and goodwill has uh, been built up, you're going <clears throat> to you're going to run into some some struggles. Um, you wouldn't be making the play uh, in any authentic way if you didn't. So we wrestled uh, through those struggles. You know, there was uh, definitely some sweat, a few tears, no blood. We got a play that uh, we were satisfied with, and we were ready now to tour it. Uh, this was one of the plays that we were going to tour nationally. And then came what may have even been a bigger challenge than creating the play which was how are we going to attract a black and white working class, middle class, and poor audience into the theater to experience this play with us. So the play, Junebug Jack, looked at this history of black and white uh, working class, poor relationships from the arrival, slavery, on through Vietnam. So, so that's, that's what the play is about. And, it's a, it, and it would be really strange if we found we were doing that play for people who had no connection with that uh, background, race, or class. Now, unfortunately, in the professional theater, uh, every survey I've looked at for the last 20 years indicates, shows that 15 percent uh, uh, that the, that eighty some percent of the audience comes from the wealthiest fifteen percent of the demographic. So that's who typically, when you're touring theater around the country, typically you're getting this fifteen percent of the demographic. And um, it's not that they are bad audience; they're very well educated, but it just doesn't reflect the entire community. And in our case, with this play it doesn't reflect a lot of the nuance and the, uh, and, and the import that we're trying to stage. We tried a number of stratagems to figure out how to get this audience in. <clears throat> Nothing was working. So then, but we, were, we weren't going to give up, and then we hit on this idea that every community, say we were going to come uh, to Blacksburg, you got interested in in wanting to uh, explore race and class here in, in Blacksburg. So the deal would be, okay, we will come do this play, but you have got to put together 
an ecumenical community choir. And what I mean by that, you've got to pull some people from your African-American church, churches, who are great singers, some of the great singers from the white churches, maybe a couple of singers from the women's chorus, some other singers maybe from the high school group, and together they're going to make this new community choir. And what we're going to do, Blacksburg, is we're going to send you the music a couple of months ahead of time, and somebody who you all choose will rehearse this group. And these are songs that we've created, and they're songs about the theme of the play, obviously. But anyway, that isn't what's on the people's mind as they come together to rehearse. They're coming together to rehearse because they love to sing, and they're good singers. And this is a chance to be in a big main stage production at the Lyric Theater. So they're excited just about that. Well, they get together, and they start singing together, and of course, the first thing that happens is they start creating a new sound that none of them had experienced before. Why? Because they hadn't sung together out of their different traditions to find this new tradition in this image of the span. So there's a great deal of excitement. And then there's a sort of cute thing that happens in, in a lot of communities, um, you know, the young people, how boring it is here. But this new sound gets out, and young people, particularly if a few are involved, then they get excited. And, and the young people are saying, yeah, something different is going to happen in our community. Let's check it out. So then a couple of uh, days or so before the production, I come into town. I stage uh, the group into the play, uh, not only with the music, but a few lines here and there. And uh, we're ready to roll. And of course, as the play opens, people from all these different groups, from the churches and so forth, they just pour in to see their people on the stage. So the, we accomplished what we, were, uh, what we were aiming in terms of this diversity of the audience. Now the most heartening part of the whole experience was that because the different groups that came in, who really didn't know each other, but the different groups that came in, because they felt so respected in their own tradition, being represented, what they were interested in and completely focused on was the other. So the white church people just were fascinated by what was happening with the black church people, not only on the stage, but in the audience and vice versa. So it, it, what, what came out of that experience was setting the stage in this community, if it's Blacksburg in Blacksburg, for a deeper exploration of race and class. These people had come together out of the pure joy of singing, and out of that joy of singing, they had formed a basis for building a deeper discussion. And then we have a methodology that helps the community do that over a period of months and even years. So that's story two. Um, story three is 1972, and it's eastern Kentucky. And a famous California singer, really at the height of her fame, has decided she's going to do a concert at a little high school gym. And she's going to do it because she wants to honor the Appalachian songbook that part of her fame rests upon. So very generous uh, thing for a star to do. People are really excited. It's in one of those little gyms where, you know, if you, if you threw a, a high, high pass, it'd get caught in the rafters. And uh, a local string band is selected to open for the famous folk singer in 1972. Well, you can just imagine the, folk, the, the string band rehearsed for several days before, and they were just really, really intent, in, intent to put on a great show. And I, I, I wasn't there, but I was told that you could hear a pin drop as the string band played. 
And the famous folk singer, of course, followed with some success. Well, afterwards, backstage, the folk singer said, look, fellas, you all were great. And I want to understand what it was, that little something special you had that, that I didn't quite get. Well, the string band, they, they're not going to talk back to a famous folk singer, so they didn't say anything. But to her credit, she was persistent. She said, I'm not leaving until you try to explain to me. I really want to know what you did was so great, and I want to know what you thought about it and why. So she stuck at it. She asked three or four times. Finally, the fiddle player spoke up. And he said, uh, well, ma'am, the only difference I could tell was that you was playing out front of them old songs, and we was just right behind them. So those are my three stories to prompt this conversation. I want to do one more thing before we... In fact, that last story sometimes I think of as a parable. Um, the, before we, we begin our conversation, and I will uh, certainly come down from on high here for the conversation that we're going to have, I want to um, give you a little excerpt of our work so you really see uh, something of, of the soul of, of what we're trying to do as a theater company. This is an excerpt from a play that we made with traditional Zuni uh, singers, storytellers, uh, dancers, musicians from Zuni Pueblo, New Mexico. That's a very traditional Pueblo, and we've been working there now for 29 years. This is one of the productions we made, and it's called Corn Mountain, Pine Mountain, Following the Seasons. Corn Mountain is the sacred mountain, Doyalani in Zuni, and Pine Mountain, of course, is the mountain between uh, Kentucky and Virginia uh, at Pound Gap. So Pine Mountain, Corn Mountain, Following the Seasons. So this was a, like a lot of our intercultural plays, it's bilingual. And Itiwan An Chawe is the Zuni language company, the first Zuni language theater company. Um, and uh, they really got started out of a process of uh, our working with them. And in some ways, they became ashamed because their own storytelling tradition had fallen off, and we were visiting Zuni regularly, and their Zuni kids were so delighted in these big Appalachian tales we were telling. And the elders realized, you know, we once had all that, and we better start back up because these kids are knocked out by it. So that, that's really how the, the company got going, Ediwan on Chawe. So anyway, this is, the, uh, this is a little excerpt from Corn Mountain, Pine Mountain, following the season. Seasons. <clears throat> Let me set the, uh, the stage for you. Um, this is uh, <clears throat> three of the uh, nine dancers in the harvest dance. And uh, we've just finished the, the harvest, and the dancers uh, for that uh, big harvest dance, which is the biggest celebration of the year, they've just exited. And uh, one of the storytellers... Uh, uh, steps forward and says, now winter comes to the people. The seeds are gathered. Lullabies are sung to them so that they will rest and be ready for the spring. And as we hear one of these lullabies trail off, another storyteller uh, steps forward and says, we no longer persist on behalf of the seed family and Mother Earth. Could this be the reason why there is so much sickness throughout the land? And as <clears throat> he says that, from upstage, this song uh, rises up from the singers upstage and then laps into a Zuni Appalachian song. And that's what we're going to hear. Oh, where are our dear mothers? Oh, where are our dear mothers? Oh, where are our dear mothers? Day is a breaking in my so 
שאומר, 